Well, good morning. It is great to see all of you this morning. Excited to uh, continue our series about finding hope and uh, looking for hope and realizing that we have hope in Christ Jesus. Now, the problem is many of us don't even know we at times need hope, right? We may not really understand the situation or the struggle uh, that we're in, what's happening around us. There is a bird uh, that has spent a lot of time outside the front door here at Family Life over the last three weeks. Now, this grackle has, uh, for uh, days, uh, spent time just looking at the front door. At first, whenever I saw him, I was like, oh, look, how sweet. This bird wants Jesus. He wants uh, to get in church. You know, he wants to hear me preach. And uh, then I realized real quickly that the bird didn't really care much about Jesus. He didn't really care uh, much about my preaching, much to my dismay. Uh, what he cared about was his reflection in the door. He's looking at this glass, and he sees a reflection of another bird. When he puffs up, guess what that bird does? That bird puffs up. When he screams, that bird what? Calls back to him. And that bird is there, and it is the enemy, and he is fighting this thing. And it's really amazing because, again, for days and, and days, this bird has shown up, and he, he stands at this door, and he fights, and he fights, and he moves over to this door. And guess what? His enemy is there, too. And then he goes over to the door by the office, and that's where the enemy is, and he is battling, and he is fighting this enemy, and he is just going at it. Now, the problem is he doesn't really know who the enemy is. He thinks he knows. He thinks that there's a, another bird, another uh, thing out there trying to get him. But he, what he doesn't recognize is that really he is his own worst enemy. He's fighting himself. And because of deception, because of lies and deceit, he believes that this other bird is out to get him when in essence he's just out to get himself and eventually he's going to waste his life. I don't know what a bird does, but they can waste their lives too, right? And miss the mark. Today we may know that we're at war. We may feel like there's a tension in a battle going on around us or inside us. The problem is we don't always know who the enemy is. It's easy for us to look across the room and say, oh, well, it's obviously Paul. Or it's obviously, uh, you know, uh, that person or this person. It's obviously that, that guy or that girl. It's obviously my spouse or it's obviously my kids or it's obviously my boss or it's obviously the guy, the neighbor that keeps uh, letting his dog do things in my yard that he doesn't let do in his yard. You know, all of those things, right? We blame others and we think we know who the enemy is. But sadly, we don't. We don't recognize that our battle is not against flesh and blood. Turn with me for a moment into Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. We'll dive into Mark here in a moment, but I just want to look here at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. It says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. But it's real easy, I think, at times to look at that person and think they're the enemy, they're the problem, or even at times miss the mark in how we allow the enemy to have his way in our lives. We allow the enemy to work, to move our hearts, to change us. We listen to voices we never should listen to. We live in a culture where bad isn't necessarily that bad, right? We live in a culture where sin isn't truly considered sin. We live in a world of what I like to call subjective truth where the highest moral standard is weakened because there is no standard. Instead, we're built with these expectations of tolerance and acceptance. Allow everyone just to do whatever they want to do. Well, when we allow everyone to do just what they want to do, guess what? There is no rules. There are no laws. There is no truth. 
And sadly, even in the church, many have lost sight of what true sin is. Now, we don't like to talk about sin, right? We often chimes, uh, choose to ignore it. We hide it. We gloss over it. We fail to take it as seriously as we should. And there are times, I think, when sin doesn't seem to be really sin to us, right? You know, times when we want to gossip or we just want to unload on somebody and it doesn't really seem like sin or manipulation, right? There are times when loss doesn't seem so evil. There are times when greed doesn't seem so selfish and times when anger doesn't seem so destructive. There are times when lying doesn't seem so deceiving and yet sin is sin. And make no mistake about it, all sin leads to death. And yet there are times when we say it's just a white lie, it's just a, 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 a little thing, it's not a big deal. It's nothing major. But when we willingly ignore God's word, we step not only into a world of hurt, but a life that leads to death. Now you need to know something about that bird that constantly attacks himself in our door. That bird is unaware of the two men that stand on the other side of the door speaking of its imminent death. That bird doesn't realize that there are two guys on the other side of the door researching what kind of bird it is so we can decide and figure out whether it's okay to kill it or not. <laughs> that bird doesn't understand that we have killed other birds and we have a deep desire to end that bird because what he is doing is he is marking up our beautiful sidewalk. That bird doesn't understand the danger that he's truly in. We, too, don't understand that danger. We don't grasp what lies lead to. We don't always grasp what gossip leads to. We don't always grasp what lust leads to. We don't always grasp what our anger leads to. We don't always grasp the full weight of our sin. But sin willingly trades the glory of God for our own glory. When we allow our anger to rule our lives, what we're saying is, God, I can't trust your grace. I can't trust your peace. I can't trust your mercy. I have to have my way. When we allow lust to guard our lives, what we say is, God, I can't be satisfied in you. I can't be satisfied in what you've given me. I can't be happy with who I am. I want more. When we gossip, what we are saying is we can't say, I, I, I trust you, God, that you've got that person, that you're going to care for that person, that you're going to correct that person, that you're going to watch over that person. We feel like we have to take it in our own power. Power. When we walk in these things, we are trading the glory of God for our own glory. And the greatest battle for hope always takes place daily in the depths of our heart. And it's a battle for lordship. Who is truly in charge of your life? And we don't know it, but on any given day, we can step way out of God's will. And the consequences are dire. Before we dive into Mark chapter 5, will you pray with me? Father, we come before you today and we ask you to speak to our hearts, God. God, I pray today that you would open up this scripture and you would truly show us uh, the depth of our own fight, the depth of our own struggle. God, that you would reveal to us how at times we may not take things as seriously as we need to. God, but you take, you take sin so serious. God, you took it so serious that you sent your son to die in our place. Sin costs you the life of your son. Sin costs us a relationship with you, and more than that, sin leads to death. And so in our own sin without you, we would be hopeless, God. But praise you, thank you for saving us and making a way for us when there was no way. So this morning, God, my prayer is that you would open our eyes to the sins that we need to realize, that you would open our eyes to the enemy 
that is out there longing to tear down our lives, and you would open our eyes to the hope that we have in you, Jesus, because you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. In your name we pray, amen. Turn with me to Mark chapter 5 as we continue uh, to walk through the life of Jesus through the eyes of Mark. Everything Christ has done or everything Christ did, he did with intention. He did with a purpose. He stepped into every moment ready. With a heart ready to reach into the lives of those who were in desperate need of his love and his grace. And at times, those who were in desperate need of his correction. Jesus lived his entire life on mission for the glory of his Father. And not anything, nothing, not a moment, not a problem, not a struggle, not an enemy could ever catch the Savior by surprise. He stood ready to set the world free from sin and shame. As we saw last week, looking at the story of the storm while Jesus is resting in the minute of it, well, I mean, the, many things caught the disciples by surprise, but nothing caught the Savior by surprise. He knew the battle that he was waging. He knew why he had come. He came to seek and to save the lost, you and me. By becoming for us substitutionary atonement, had Christ failed in any way, there would be no hope for us. But we have hope in the fierce, fiercest of storms because our God will not fail. And today I want to look at a way that our God does not fail and will not fail. Look with me at Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 1. It says, They went across the lake, speaking of the Sea of Galilee, to the region of Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart, and he broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and he fell on his knees in front of him. And he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, son of, uh, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you un impure spirit. And then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs were feeding on a nearby hillside. And Jesus, the demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. And he gave them permission. And the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending to the pigs ran off, reported this to the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and they told about the pigs as well. And then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave the region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus had done, and all the people were amazed. We have hope in the fiercest of storms because our God will not fail. He doesn't fail. When Jesus arrives there on the shore of Gerasene, a man with an impure spirit approaches him from the tombs right there to meet him face to face. Mark gives an in-depth account of this man, a detailed picture of this broken, 
soul caught in the throes of a desperate, desperate storm of life, right? This man is at war. He lived in the tombs, isolated, broken, and hopeless. Many had tried to bind him. They tried to cure him. They tried to fix him, but no one could. He was notorious for breaking the bonds. And night and day, he would cry out aloud, and he would cut himself in desperation. A literal translation, a literal translation of the predicament that this man was in would be that he was under the influence of one or more evil spirits. You see, they were running the show. They were driving the direction of his life. Today, we are at war. And our struggle is not against flesh and blood. There is a very real enemy looking for every opportunity to destroy and devour our lives. Now, this enemy is very cunning, and he's very crafty, and he's very good at making his ways not seen by us. His ways are very tempting at times. They look enjoyable. They look like what we long for, like we want. But this enemy longs to possess and to control our lives. He may not be able to come into our lives if we are in Christ, but he sure can determine our steps if we allow him to. And this enemy will do nothing but his own desires and his own will. And he will do everything within his power to influence, to pressure, and to oppose you and I. Years ago, my wife and I went to a marriage conference and uh, one of the guys was talking uh, about marriage and just the, the beauty of it and everything. And he said, he said this about uh, when our spouse becomes the enemy. He says, when you're Picture yourself walking down the, the, the shore with your spouse, your husband or your wife, holding hands and just walking along, and suddenly someone or something begins to whisper in your ear, they don't love you, they don't care for you, they're not good enough. You kind of listen a little bit, but you shut it out, and you continue to hold your spouse's hand, but as the time goes on, they begin to whisper more and more. And more and more, eventually so much so that you let go of your spouse's hand and you grab the hand of what? The enemy. And you begin to walk down the beach with your spouse a little bit behind as you hold hands with the enemy. This picture rocked me because it's the true picture of when we allow the enemy into our life, right? We are letting go of the Savior, God. And we're taking hands with the enemy. They begin to guide us. They begin to lead us. And those under the influence of the enemy walk away from the will of the Father, drifting deeper and deeper into sin, separated from God. Now, I don't think we say this enough, but the wages of sin is death every time. And we may not understand the depth of what that means, but let me kind of break it down like this. You see, there's a lot of ways that we can die. We can die emotionally, numbed by the brokenness of our sin. We can die um, relationally, losing our our relationships with those that we care about, those that, that, that love us and care for us, God himself. We can die spiritually where we no longer long for God's word, his truth, his love, his grace. We can die morally where we no longer see right from wrong and we just do whatever we desire. We can even die physically, right? But no matter which way it is, all sin leads to death. Every single time. In this desperate out-of-control soul was by all means dangerous. He was by all means broken, both inside and out. But understand this, he was just like you and I when we allow sin to work in our lives. When we allow the enemy to take control, he was wild, lost, and spiraling out of control. On the brink of death, headed to hell. 
And I wonder if there were at times just a a few moments of clarity where he could kind of think clearly in the moment. And it's likely in those moments that he felt the full weight of the situation, right? He felt how unlovable he truly was. He felt how unwanted he seemed to be. He looked at his life and saw how unrecognizable it had become. And he felt abandoned and beyond all hope. See, that's what sin does to us. Sin takes us from a loving, intimate relationship with God and others, and it moves us to a place of isolation, a place of fear, and and where we're no longer recognizable, we're abandoned and beyond all hope. And that's the enemy's greatest win, right, is where he can get us to believe that there is no hope for us. And here's the sad thing. When we don't know Christ, that is the way we live our life is hopeless, right? But did you know that even believers can get to the point where they feel like there is no hope? Even believers can get to the point where they allow the enemy to come so deep into their life, to break into their marriage, their home, their family, their work, their job, their life, their very identity, and feel lost and abandoned and hopeless. But we need to understand that no one is beyond the hope and redemptive power of the Savior. I'm going to say that again because I think that's really, really important today that we understand that is that no one is beyond the power and the redemptive hope that we have in Christ Jesus. No one is beyond that. Now, we are at war, but we need to understand this. This war that we're in, it has already been won. You need to understand that because whenever this guy comes running up to Jesus, right, whenever he comes up on the shore side, the battle, it's already been won, right? There's not much of a fight that's about to take place in this moment. Actually, if you look at his words and you hear what he says, he says, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. Does that sound like somebody that's going to win? Does that sound like somebody that's going to have hope? Now, he's still not worshiping. He's not bowing in worship. He's, not ba- he's just trying to save his miserable hide in this moment the enemy is. But Jesus deals with the enemy that holds this man captive. But not only that, he deals with the man's sin and his shame. Because when Jesus restores him, he raises him to a brand new life. He sends the enemy out, away from him. And the enemy never stood a chance. Sin and death held no power over the bringer of life. But true and lasting change takes place only by the power of God. We can't save ourselves in these situations. When I'm knee deep in sin, when I'm knee deep in, or whenever I'm above my head, in, 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 in the enemy's power, I can't just pull up my bootstraps and do better. I need Jesus. I need the Savior. When sin has its hold on us, whenever the enemy has control of us, we don't just do better. We have to surrender to the Savior. True and lasting change takes place only by the power of God. I mean, we can change behavior, right? We can change a little bit, but it, but it never lasts. We could try to do better, but we will eventually falter again, and we can try to climb out of the hole that we're in, but that's really, truly an impassable, slippery slope that we will just fall back into where we're at. What we need is God himself to reach down and pull us to safety. It's only the Lord Jesus who makes lasting changes in our lives. Why? Because he changes us from the inside out. 
a new behavior, a new uh, attitude, a new thought doesn't change what only God can change in the heart of a man. And here we see that that's exactly what Jesus does. This man is fully restored. When the others find him right at the end of his encounter with the Savior, what is he? He's sitting there. He's calm. He's quiet. No chains. No locks. He's fully dressed. And he's what? In his right mind. He's completely restored. Maybe today you look at your own life and you look at your own situation and you feel that perhaps you are too far gone. You need to understand that you're not. Perhaps you feel that the scars run too deep from your past and from the things that others have done to you or you've done in action. The scars and the pain runs too deep. It doesn't. It's quite possible that the storm that you're facing feels like it's too much for you to handle. Well, yeah, it is. But Jesus stands ready to set you free. I love this story because here's the beauty of it, right? Disciples and Jesus are on one side of the lake. They're on one side of the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus tells them, hey, let's get in the boat. And they travel across the lake, and they run into what? One person. One man. They heal that one man. Nobody else wants to be healed. Nobody else wants a part of him. They get back in the boat, and guess what? They leave. But Jesus comes for the one. That's you and me. That's us. In whatever circumstance we're going through, in whatever battle we're waging, whatever war it is, no matter whether we know the enemy or not, we can know the Savior. We can recognize our desperate need. And if we believe in Jesus and turn away from our sin to the giver of life, we will what be restored but we have to respond I think that's the most beautiful part about this is the man truly responds now look there's about to be a crowd that's going to gather and their response is very very different they respond to Jesus and the man in somewhat of a surprising way. But it reveals much about their hearts, right? In the storms of life, more is revealed about our heart than the heart of God. And you would think that in this moment, they would be ecstatic for him, right? They know this man. They've tried to subdue him. They've tried to bind him. They've tried to stop him. They've tried to fix him. And you'd think they would be so excited about what God has done, the life changing transformation that has taken place in his life. But they're not. They're not excited. You would assume that they would be falling in line, right? To receive this personal touch themselves, that they would be falling in line for Jesus to do something amazing and incredible in their lives, but they don't. In the end, the others wanted nothing to do with Jesus and they ask him to leave see they saw the undeniable results of this miraculous moment and instead of falling on their knees in worship they tell Jesus what we want nothing to do with you why why would they see the, the change and the, 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 the beauty of the moment, the, the, the excitement of what Jesus is doing, the power of God working in the life of another? Why would they see that and not want it from themselves? Well, the honest truth is they were under the influence of the enemy as well. But maybe they just couldn't realize it. 
Maybe they didn't truly understand it. Or maybe they did. Maybe they feared like many of us do about what it would mean to personally surrender your life to the Savior. What would it mean for them personally if Jesus stayed? If he continued to preach? If he continued to change their world around us? Shane Pruitt says this, he says, too many people want a God that loves and accepts them, but doesn't command and change them. Too many people want a God that loves and accepts them, but doesn't command and change them, but he doesn't work that way. I want God to be okay with the way that I live and the way that I act, the the lifestyle that I choose. I want God to be okay with the identity that I have. No, God comes in and he steps into our lives and he makes all things new. He takes our life, our desires, our wants, and he aligns them with his will, his desires, and his wants. It's God's way or no way. And honestly, we don't like that. We don't like that. Because of the desires of our flesh. Because of what the world tells us. And because at times of what the enemy whispers in our ear. Too many of us, we love the concept of God. But it's a concept of a God that we create ourselves. It's not the God who created us. See, we see the evidence of sin working in the man with an impure spirit. But we also see the evidence of sin working powerfully and mightily in the lives of the others who see Jesus and send him away. And this is how the enemy works in and through our lives. You see, sin leads us to rebel against God's word. Sin numbs us to the wrongs that we commit. Sin sin destroys our relationships with God and with others. And sin is too great for us to escape on our own. I mean, we see that full force in the life of this man. He had rebelled against every truth there was. He was numb to the wrongs that he was committing. He destroyed his relationship with God and others. And sin was too great for him to escape on his own. We see that pretty obviously, but we miss it, I think, a little bit in the life of everyone else around him. Because the same thing happens. They don't want to hear the word that God has. They're numb to the wrongs that they're committing. Their relationship with Jesus is destroyed in this moment because they send him away. And they don't understand that their sin is too great for them to escape on their own. It has them. See, there's an enemy out there. And honestly, he's not that far out there. He's probably in this room. That's fighting for control of our lives. Sin by its very nature is destructive. It leads to death. It destroys everything. The problem is that it's not always apparent to us. The problem is we don't always recognize it. One of the the greatest things that uh, you can do whenever you go into counseling is you look at a problem and you what? You name that problem, right? You name that struggle. You give it a name. And when you give it a name, you basically take power over it, right? It's time that we started calling sin, sin. That we started recognizing it for what it truly is. It's, it's not just a little flaw that I have. It is open rebellion against God. And it kills every time. You see, the problem with sin is it's not a, a simple behavioral issue. It's a problem of the heart. 
because we're all in desperate need of a Savior. And he's the only one that can change us from the inside out. But listen to this. Because of this story, we know this is true, right? Jesus intentionally steps into our story. He intentionally crossed the sea. He intentionally crossed eternity to die in our place to give us hope. He does what only he can do. Jesus truly is our hope. And Jesus can and will deliver you, but you must be willing to surrender all to him. You must recognize your sin and your desperate need for him. You must believe that he is the hope and you must turn away from your sin to the giver of life. But there's other, another thing I think that's key. Because in the end, we have to tell others what God has done in us. And we have to share the hope that we have. But in order to share that hope, right, we have to have that hope. I love it. He says, Jesus, let me come with you. And Jesus says, no, you go home and you tell others about the joy and the life that you have. And he goes home to the Decapolis, which is a group of 10 cities, and he begins to proclaim the word and the gospel. So that later on, when some of the disciples get there, guess what? There's believers already there waiting. But it starts with our surrender. Do we understand the sin in our lives? Can we call it what it truly is? Can we recognize the gossip for what it is? Can we recognize the lust for what it truly is? Can we recognize the lies for what they truly are? Can, can we recognize the anger for what it truly is? Can we recognize the scars for what they truly are, the marks of sin in our life? But can we also recognize that there is a Savior who can wash us white as snow, who can cleanse every sin? throwing it as far as the east is from the west, setting us free, giving us life. We pray with me. Jesus, we come before you today and we just ask you, God, speak to our hearts. Speak to the depth of our soul. God, you know the war that wages in each and every one of us. You know the sins that we battle with. God, you know how we struggle with these things. God, you know the gossip that sometimes occurs in my own life. God, you know the anger that rises quite often. God, you know the lust that at times I struggle with. God, you know the lies that I sometimes tell and God sadly you know how I can easily justify those things God today I want to call them what they are I want to call them sin and I want to recognize that the only way to get rid of it the only way to be healed of it is to admit it and to turn from it to you and today I do that, God. I repent of my sin and I turn to you and I ask you, God, make me new. God, work in our hearts today. Change our lives today. Transform us, make us new so that we can sit there in our right minds, God. Clean, fully clothed, and full of hope. Because you are our hope. Thank you today for allowing us to find you, God. <laughs> Thank you, God, for finding us. For meeting us right where we are with the truth of your word. In your name we pray. Amen.